my not so humble opinion, I haven't come across in the last quarter of a century any one of this man's generation who gets close. This is 50 years since we opened this shop and for half of that time we've had an association with Oliver and we're still talking to each other. Just. Just. We may not be after, after this. 20 something years ago we met and I saw a painting and I bought it without hesitation and I have continued to buy for the whole of that 25 years. I feel very privileged to have been able to, to work with you and to look at what you're doing now. We're here to look at Oliver's paintings, but I don't know how many of you know that he is also a filmmaker. He has shown all over the place, Whitechapel Gallery, the Barbican, the Institute of Contemporary Arts, Kettle's Yard, Pompidou Centre in Paris. He's had exhibitions and festivals in Naples and Toronto and Salzburg and Munich and Zimbabwe, all over the place. I have to be very careful because you don't really like talking about what they mean, do you? Uh, maybe. <laughs> because we haven't rehearsed this. It's not true. We have rehearsed this. <laughs> Will you tell us a bit about your influences? When I was studying, I was a painter and I, I did a master's at the same place I did a BA. And I decided to give up painting uh, as my main focus and I started filmmaking because of Alan Wellsford as my, he was my inspiration. He did an animation called a storm in a teacup and there was a little boat in a teacup animation and I just thought oh, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make films so I, I my focus on filmmakers became my influence but then when I, I returned to painting I started looking at early renaissance painting and uh, I used to be a, a Rembrandt fan but I gave Rembrandt up for paintings where the subject was where the light was coming from not not somebody under a shadow, like a Scorsese film, but a, somebody standing there and they're glowing. That's the early Renaissance, that's the best stuff. You get a gold, gold leaf bolter piece, Italian, what's his, what's his name, Frangelico. You made a pilgrimage, didn't you, to see? I did, yeah, Frangelico. Talk about that. Frangelico's like the prettiest early Renaissance painter. And I uh, did a pilgrimage to, to Florence and Rome to try and see all his paintings in situation, in the, in the situation they were intended for. If you ever go to Florence, there's one museum that never has a queue and it's called um, the Museo de San Marco. It's a San Marco museum and it's a, it's a, it's a, a monastery that's been converted, it's now a museum. It was a monk and he painted the frescoes on the walls and these are frescoes for monks. So these are for the, for the well-read religious types. So you see a painting of the, the crucifix and what it's about is not very clear to me as a person who's not a studied theologian. And that's, that's where the magic starts to happen when you start making up the stories. Yeah, so early Renaissance is my favourite because it looks alien. The perspective is wonky. And uh, there's no, none of this attempt to mimic a photograph. I, I, when, I, when I started making films, I also gave up painting from photos. I think that was important because what's the point? Painting from a photograph when you can just take a photograph. I haven't heard a good argument against that yet. There's, there's these two on the corner here. The top one, the red altar, uh, that's, a, that's from a Frangelico. It's like a comic book strip of like a local saint and there'll be little scenes from the saint's life. Usually it's like somebody being boiled alive or someone being hacked to death or they try to hack them to death, but the, the blades go blunt because God saved them. And these are great, this is where the artist is having a little bit, he's a little bit liberated and having a bit of fun. So I started copying his, his Predella paintings and I'd remove the people. So it become a set for a film rather than a, 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 a depiction of an event. 
He's such a pretty painter, for Angelico. And then there's uh, quite a few of these are from the National Gallery, like the, in the corner there's the guy lifting the, the uh, fake trees. That's from a, an early Renaissance painting in the National Gallery. And I go there all the time, and I always look at the wonky paintings. It's the ones that they don't, they don't quite know how, you know, they don't know the rules of perspective as we know them now. So they, they struggle with the mathematics of angles. I like that stuff. The single tree there, is that a Renaissance work? That's from, yeah, so that made that tree is a Fra Angelico tree. I never, I don't think he quite depicted uh, species in an accurate way. He didn't know how to, this is a laurel tree or whatever. So I, I, I loved his trees, so I'd copy his trees, put them on my own paintings. It's kind of like to try and unlearn what I've learned from botanical illustration and depicting the world in front of you. Rather, let's go for some guy who's trying to do his best. It's always a worry because when my wife comes down to visit and has a look at something which you've done and says, wow, that's fantastic, the next thing you're doing is Destroy it. Destroying it. Tell, it. tell us about this extraordinary perversity that you've got in terms of how does, how does that work? <laughs> Doris, um, uh, maybe it's your wife. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> it could well be, yes. So the process for me at the moment is I'll go to, I'll get to the studio in the morning and the picture might be A, good or B, rubbish. And then by the end of the day, it's either A, good or B, rubbish. And then I go home and it'll be the opposite, it'll be good or rubbish. It's, it, destroying your picture is, a, is, a, is, is really important. So some, some things you just have to get rid of. And you'll come back, I'll come back to them, I'll do the same image again later on. I'm always correcting things with a reflection or draw, drawing horizon line across the middle of a canvas. If something's not working out, I'll put a line across the middle, like put the horizon line back in. And the figure there, that painting was a real problem and then I suddenly, I fixed it and I did it in one, in like half an hour it was good and I don't remember how it got good. But uh, it's like, that's it. And it's, yeah, it's maybe, it's Jesus hiding under an umbrella maybe. Something like that. It's not, it's not that, but. So there is, a, there is a figure of the Christ in it. The one to the right of that. I happen to know that's political, isn't it? Um, Can, can you talk a little bit about the, how you feel the artist should think about uh, political stuff? So that's from uh, the only surviving photograph of a moment, I think. And I'm always into that. I think an artist's role is to be a witness. I'm a bit obsessed with donkeys. So what I, I was watching um, Rossellini's uh, journey, journey to Italy with Ingrid Bergman, who I'm obsessed about. And she's, her and her husband, their relationship's falling apart. They never had kids. It's falling apart in Italy as they're in Naples. And she's walking through Naples and Ingrid Bergman looks amazing. You know, the camera loves her and I love her. But then they're, they're talking in Italian and somebody mentions, oh, look how small that donkey is. And there's a donkey, there's a donkey on the street walking past. And, I, and I'll forget the film completely and I'll just watch the donkey. So I, so I think the donkey is the... Um, you know, it's, it's a witness, like that Ahazar Balthazar by Robert Bresson, where the donkey lives this life through the cruelty of the people around it. The donkey is the great thing of that movie. And I wished the other, there wasn't anyone else around. I just wanted to watch a film about a donkey. So I thought, I'd better make that film. So I went to Greece, and I went to the smallest island in Greece to find, this, find a donkey to film. And it got to this island, and there was only one donkey on this island. It was, it's a film about a donkey that lives alone on an island. I went back and I was walking down the road. I lived near Blackheath at the time and it turned out there was a donkey track <laughs> there and I could, have, I could have made my film in Blackheath. <laughs> Thank God I didn't because I did try to make a film of that donkey later on and it was rubbish. But this, this donkey, the, the donkey is the, is the witness. He, the donkey will always ab be there and it's I always think it's kind of observing us you know it's a it's a tragic comedic there, thing there's an awful lot going on with that donkey over there on the left hand side if you look at it because the number of 
um, human legs it's got underneath it. And... Yeah, it's the people, people inside the donkey. <laughs> right? Is that like people inside the lion? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, we are a lion. Maybe to get, you know, like, I, I always think there's a lot of everything, there's a lot of pressing issues on the individual, and maybe as a group we're better. I don't know. The togetherness. There's, there's an extraordinary donkey on the end, isn't there? That's a, don that's a donkey suit, yeah. A donkey so I, I, suit? I made these donkey suits so people can wear these, you can wear the donkey suit. Does that make sense? Uh, I was going to ask what part of the character that appears to be hiding behind the donkey takes place. But the other thing that strikes me is the lighting on it. it it's like storm light or theatrical lighting. Um, I'm wondering how your filmmaking relates to the art in a more direct way. That's that Baroque thing of the lighting. And, and, and you can listen to Scorsese talk about how he's used painting to inform his filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm a painter and I'm using film to inform my painting maybe. Right. It's maybe the opposite, but maybe the, the thing with the donkey pictures is, I always thought about I'd like a car light, or that you're the light and you illuminate this creature in the dark. So I always thought that if you're, if you're the source of the light, you know that the world is dark without you. So, uh, th yeah, this creature is in the dark, in a, in a stormy sky, mm -hmm. and you've, you've come across it. That's the story I'm, I'm saying. What is that creature? I mean, I, I, I'm not, I couldn't say 100% what it is. Uh, I, I, I have done, made protest videos in the past where we broke into toxic waste landfill sites in a donkey costume. Like the, um, what do you call the... What's the horse? Trojan horse. We made films where we people wore a pantomime horse costume. Something about solidarity, working together. Will you will you say a little about your use of gold leaf? Italian Renaissance altarpieces. You know that thing where you go into an old church and there's, there's a, like in in Greek myth, in Greek churches and Orthodox churches. There's no lighting, so the gold shines, and then the actual painting bit's really dark. Um, and I thought I should have a go. And I saw there was a there was an Italian altar piece show at the National Gallery a few years ago, and you got to walk all the way around the this um, what do you call a painting that's made from like multiple panels, like more than a triptych, like a heptoptelic or something. It's like twenty different pictures all glued together in this gold leaf frame. And you see all the way around it, it looked like a spaceship. So maybe, uh, maybe the gold is more than the yellow. And the yellow is, is very yellow, but the gold is more yellow. I think the assumption of gold leaf paintings is they're religious. So that's something to play with, that assumption is, or that consideration that in the viewer is something to play with. Would you say you're religious? Um, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an atheist, that's for sure. I don't think you can tell me that God doesn't exist. Nor can you tell me you don't. <laughs> Will you say something about the multiple legs? I mean, I've always been obsessed with shoes because I don't fit in normal shoes. So like, I'm a size 13 or 14 and sizes stop at 12. So I've always been obsessed by shoes that I can't wear. So painting <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Painting feet in pictures. I, I, I think multi legs, uh, it's. Uh, I don't know, why not have more legs? Why not? Will you say something about this, the sail paintings? Uh, I, I do those quite a lot, and I can't remember what I did the first one. I think I just, it was something that wasn't working, so I just I squared, I painted over it in a square, and I thought, oh, it's a sail. And it, I, it's like, the, it's like being a witness. Is there something about that witness thing? You're, you're looking at the covering. You, you taught for a while. Did, did you enjoy that? Um, it's okay. I always feel like I'm giving too much away or not enough or make myself incoherent or it's too confusing. I try.
Can you tell me a little bit about these single figures that you have that look like sort of Englishmen abroad getting burned? <laughs> <laughs> Where, where are they? They're about an Englishman getting burnt. <laughs> there are awkward people abroad or by the seashore. There's, me there's my own memories connected to it and I'm almost putting myself now on my memories. Yeah. You know, you, you, have, you have memories and can you put yourself now in the memories of the past, I suppose? So maybe that's, you know, my condition is progressive so it's never Sorry, it's never standing still. So there's always an element of putting myself now on that, on those past moments. Yeah. Will you say something about, don't if you don't want to, but say something about how the work maybe has changed over the time and how your current situation, whether that has changed the work or the way you feel about the work? Using a, we, we, using a wheelchair most of the time has formed my process. I think it's, it's part of it, but it's not. It's just made me make more, like focus more on painting. I, 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 I go to the studio to escape, I think, and to get involved and focus on something else. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Is, is making frames out of matchsticks, is that therapy or does that... Yeah, help? like... Don't, hark back to a previous life that you they had. They didn't mention it, but I made those frames. <laughs> Very proud of them. And it takes a long time, and then you have to you put the matches on, you sand them down, and there's something about the gold. I lay the gold down. I'm very, I'm a very bad gilder. Don't don't ask me to gild anything. Um, uh, it cracks and uh, it doesn't land flat. And I'm happy with that because that's when the picture comes out through that awkwardness. So the matches are kind of, they're fiddly and you're kind of working out, but you just, you know, one next to the other, cut those in half, glue them down, hold them there. So there's something, it's less immediate. It's more like slowly but surely. I kind of like it's like a, you make things in a, in a sweatshop kind of a way. Is that fair? I'm still making the films, right? I still like make, I'd sent off over COVID, during COVID I isolated for a while and uh, I started filming this building site across the way and I sent the film off and it's 900 feet of film. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but that's 25 half an hour footage. It's a lot of money. I sent it off, it got, came back, half of it was blank and the other half was shit. And I got really excited. I was like, this is it, this is gonna be the next epic. <laughs> I'm really grateful to you today for being as open as you have been, because I think you've um, told me more and us more uh, in the last half an hour than perhaps you've told me in the last 25 years. So that's, it's very good of you. Thank you all for listening, but thank you mostly. Um, I, I don't really want to say much other than I'm so grateful for you talking like this. And I just feel that we are very, very privileged. So thank you. Thank you for coming.